Welcome in to another edition of Conversations with Paul Brown. We are in West Pelzer, and if it weren't for the fact it was raining, we would be down in Andy Gambrell's studio. That's right. But as it is, we're up at their nice house, and we're going to be talking to him. He grew up here, has basically traveled the world, and has now returned home, and is an artist of renown. I was a diligent student, so I ended up graduating top of my class, and so I had a uh, scholarship opportunities academically and athletically. So um, I, I had several opportunities. I ended up uh, having the opportunity to combine several scholarships together and to attend Furman University with full scholarship coverage. I began Furman with the uh, certainty that I wanted to, to paint. I didn't really know what that meant at that point in my life. I, I was a young man who found great joy in making pictures. Uh, I was a bit naive to the greater world of, of art. And uh, I knew that that was what I wanted to do. But I, I went to study studio art. And in the course of my studies, I was required to study art history as well. But I fell in love with the art history and ended up pursuing dual degrees in uh, studio art and art history. What caught your interest in the history of art? There are many different types of artists. Some focus on a particular visual system and learn the technical skills related to that. But there's another type of artist that I identify with that studies all types of visual systems and then tries to contribute to that historic dialogue between artists. And so uh, studying art history gave me insight into how a painter uh, identified him or herself, uh, identified their place in their community, in their world, and how they sought to express what they felt inside through the lens of that community and through that culture. And so I learned an awful lot about how to be a painter through studying how other painters had lived. And that was something that resonated with me. Every time I would encounter a new artistic period or a new artistic approach, it would color how I approached painting in my own studio. And so I worked through many modes of expression, many styles, many approaches. In some cases, I was uh, appreciating something and extending that tradition. In some cases, I was reacting against because I didn't like it. For example, with abstract painting, I remember as a young man, I was very interested in representational painting, and so that appealed to me. I, I enjoyed Which is math. what? Renaissance-style uh, illusion painting. So if I want to look at the real world and paint it in a way that looks uh, what you might call realistic, there's a system of rules for that. So you look at uh, the ratio and the proportions and try to get the mathematics correct. And as a young man, I, I remember seeing abstract painting for the first time, and that seemed to me to be a little bit far out. I didn't really know what I was looking at. But there was a moment um, on my first trip to New York City when I was on a trip with, with Furman, and I saw several of the works of, of um, American painters at the Museum of Modern Art, and they really moved me. And it was an interesting experience because these same paintings in reproduction didn't do anything for me. Uh, but the actual objects standing in front of them as a human, the objects had a presence. They really resonated with me. They moved me. And that, that led to a, a curiosity about that that would take years later before that manifested in my work. And, and it, I didn't know how to speak that language yet. I knew I was, I was going to be a painter. I was a hopeless romantic. I had never really considered the economics of the situation. Um, and I figured I'd blindly found my way to that point, and I, I wanted to continue on that path. And so that landed me at a job in a coffee shop in Greenville. So I, uh, I've worked a number of odd jobs in the hopeless romantic pursuit of painting. And I, I had a little studio in Traveler's Rest, and I painted for about two years there. And those paintings uh, were, were really a big deal for me because it was the first group of work I had made without a professor looking over my shoulder. It was the first group of paintings that I was really going to take out and meet the world with as an individual. And to my surprise, they, they really connected with the larger art market. Um, those very same paintings uh, were declined for exhibition in coffee shops in Greenville. But they ended up getting me full scholarships to graduate school. And that's when I learned that, that not only is taste subjective, but not everyone in positions of authority is, is necessarily uh, equipped to be there. So, um, but I did a lot of research in those years uh, to see where I might want to further my studies. And I discovered that there were a lot of really uh, serious painters who had moved to South Florida. So Miami had a very rich underground community 
of heavyweight painters who had been seminal figures in the history of art uh, in post-war painting in New York City from the 40s through the 70s. And those were the paintings that really spoke to me. And so it, it wasn't that I wanted to paint in the same way they did, but I wanted to, to learn something from their approach to life, their approach to picture making. I chose to attend the University of Miami. That experience was transformative for me because it, it was the first time I had left my my nest of being at home to uh, encounter the, the global art discussion as a young man who was serious about his craft. And so things kind of took their course from there. All right, when we come back, Andy, I want you to tell us about uh, where your pursuits have taken you because it's, it, you've gone to a lot of different places. You're in Miami, and your paintings, your work is being accepted, and you're, I guess, making some sales? You have to be a little bit of a yeah. self-starter in this line of work, and so I had exhibited a good deal in student exhibitions and things. In that effort, I got to know a good many people in Miami who were very wonderful and supportive people. I ended up uh, garnering the attention of some folks in Miami who uh, directed uh, my work to Dorsch Gallery. So there's a gentleman named Brooke Dorsch, and he had a gallery at that time in Miami. At that time, it was just a bunch of warehouses, and it wasn't a, a very glamorous place. And now you go through there, and there's uh, Louis Vuitton shops, and it's really? very posh, and, and it's uh, not quite what it used to yeah. be. But that was an interesting time, because I was cutting my teeth as a professor. I was learning to teach drawing and painting. Um, exhibiting professionally and also uh, served for a year as the gallery director for the University of Miami after graduation. So that was uh, an interesting time. A lot happened. You then end up going overseas. A little while later, I worked up to that. Yes, sir. I, I, um, I had wanted to travel, but um, my, my interest in uh, cultivating the skills as a professor were um, were, were dear to me. That was something I wanted to do. A lot of my heroes in, in art were individuals who had both made great work but also tried to mentor and support those around them to do so. I was in Atlanta for several years. Then I wanted to, to come back to the upstate. I, I've always had this impulse to uh, acquire the skills to be a painter but then to somehow champion upstate South Carolina and be a resource here. Uh, so I made that first attempt uh, when I left the Savannah College of Art and Design in Atlanta, came here, I bought this property and, and built the studio. And uh, before I could begin work in the studio, I was contacted by the Savannah College of Art and Design to travel to Hong Kong to uh, teach in their program there. So that was a, an unexpected but very welcome opportunity. I had a lot of fun there. What was that like for a, a white boy from West Pelzer in Hong Kong? I mean, now you're an, an artist in your own right, but still, what kind of a clash was that? It was very fascinating. It, it, was, uh, it was high speed because it, was, it, it wasn't something I was planning to do. And so I was, I was quite literally drafting lessons on the flight to China um, and I had to hit the ground running because it was it was close to the school year beginning and so I believe I was there for a few weeks before it really dawned on me that no one spoke my language and, but but you know, in all fairness Hong Kong has a, uh, a two language uh, system and so Cantonese and English are official languages doesn't mean that everyone speaks English but it, it's it's user friendly you, you can get around um, I taught in a community called Sham Shui Po which was on the uh, mainland side in Kowloon. Teaching there was a little bit removed from Hong Kong Island. And so Hong Kong Island is a little more cosmopolitan. Sham Shui Po is a little more uh, authentic to the local culture in, in, in China. And it was a real wonderful thing because I met a lot of incredible people that were local to Hong Kong. And I'm, a lot of my colleagues uh, got apartments on Hong Kong Island right upon arrival and stayed in many of the areas that were sort of um, set up to cater to expatriates okay. and to keep it familiar for them. I took a different route. I, I stayed in hostels, I moved around, I, I wanted to really experience uh, life in Hong Kong. Made some really wonderful friends there. One of those was an illustrator who's becoming quite famous now named Jonathan J. Lee. Uh, he used to draw for Marvel Comics and DC Comics and he was 
uh, teaching his first classes in China at, at the Savannah College of Art and Design when I uh, came over there. And so we, we struck up a friendship and he was very generous to introduce me around to his uh, local group of friends. Uh, one of which, uh, his name is Yoshi and he's a sake sommelier. And so through him I got to meet a lot of wonderful people in the restaurant business and that sort of thing. But a lot, a lot of wonderful memories from there and, and I'll be making return trips because I built some lasting friendships there. How was the transition as a professor from going from basically Atlanta to Hong Kong? It was uh, in many ways familiar. Uh, I, I really applaud the Savannah College of Art and Design because they do a wonderful job of teaching a very structured foundations curriculum. Foundations is the first two years of an artist's training uh, in that system. So things like two-dimensional design, three-dimensional design, color theory, basic drawing skills. Not every art program requires students to go through that training, uh, but, but quality art programs do, and it makes a big difference. If a student has a workable set of skills, then when you have a mature conversation as to what they want to make, uh, they've been equipped to, to meet you halfway. Uh, but if you have a program without that, in many ways, the student's progress is held back by not having that basic vocabulary. So a lot of the things I had taught before for the university, uh, I was teaching some similar content there. But a very different culture. Um, there's a rich heritage of sort of duplicating uh, previous masterworks with calligraphy and things like that. Uh, whereas in the Western tradition, we place more value on novelty and innovation. And so sometimes when mentoring young designers, that was at odds. You know, you're, you're working with someone in a more Western uh, approach to bring out something like individual creativity in a culture that very much identifies as a community. And, and so sometimes it was less uh, of a culture shock with the content of what I was teaching and more so with regard to the... Um, the culture in general. But everyone was very warm, very friendly. There was a real hunger for hands-on skills though in, in Hong Kong in a way that I didn't necessarily experience in the US. And I wouldn't say that about Atlanta specifically, but in general, the last 13 years of teaching, the millennial students have generally gravitated more towards technology, wanting to finish a design in the computer, wanting to cut things with a laser cutter than doing it by hand. And in many ways, those technologies are incredible and they're wonderful to learn. Um, but it was a bit refreshing uh, to see students when I was in Hong Kong that were really hungry to say, okay, I want to learn how to do this with the machine, but I also want to have to be a master of my craft. And that, that culture of mastery, uh, there's a real heritage of that there uh, that I haven't experienced as much in the U.S. And so it, it really resonated with me as a person who has pursued uh, painting my whole life. And so that, that really connected. I enjoyed that very much. When you introduce yourself, say, to another artist mm -hmm. and you tell him or her what you do, mm -hmm. what's your explanation of who you are and how you express yourself? In a very general way, I identify as an abstract painter, which means that uh, while all styles of painting are abstract philosophically because you're, you're making an abstract representation, the term abstract painter generally points towards uh, late modernism or approaches towards uh, taking something from nature and then rather than portraying it as it is, you change it in some manner for some purpose. I, I need a certain set of ingredients for a recipe that I'm making and so I cultivate a lifestyle where I'm always looking for or open to those ingredients that might work. And so with painting, uh, one of the things that moves me a great deal is color. And so one of the, the wonderful aspects of late modernism in American painting are, are there these great big paintings that allow surfaces of color to present themselves. And it's not for everyone, but it's something that for me, uh, I find a lot of emotional resonance in that. So when I make a painting, I, I'm looking for a way to present color. So rather than, for example, wanting to show off technique of drawing a person very realistically, and I've trained people to do that, so I recognize the, the value in that, but it doesn't do anything for me poetically. I, I don't get any aesthetic emotion from that. When I walk from my house to my studio on the back of my property, I pass a row of oak trees and those oak trees, uh, at the base of the trees, there's a very distinct form in the stump. And so I, I made several drawings from those stumps and made them in a very angular and geometric way 
so that those shapes could then contain color. And that color also comes from the environment. So I'm, I'm looking at nature. Uh, I'm, I'm really meditating on that, that feeling I have when I'm looking at, at that color in the landscape and trying in some way to let that feeling come across in, in the design that I make. I find that paintings speak to me when there's nothing unnecessary in the picture. I can spend more time in front of a painting that gives me the impression that everything is integral to that painting's presence than I can in front of something with a lot of extraneous details. That being said, when I look at nature, I tend to see visual scenarios that are more timeless and universal, uh, things that allow for me to make a picture that might speak to a person in 100 years or, or may have spoken to a person from 50 years back rather than making something extremely specific to our times. And so I'm open to influence from everything around me, but when I look for pictorial content, I, I try to find forms that are something that might speak across cultures. What do you want to be doing now that you're back home? What's the best thing as far as making a living mm -hmm. that can bring a smile to your face? What would that consist of? Being able to take my experience and my skills and serve uh, in a place that matters. And so I, I've loved all of the communities that have allowed me to be a part of them, but I've had an ache where I've wanted to, to do that same kind of service here in upstate South Carolina. I know there are a lot of wonderful uh, resources in South Carolina, a lot of wonderful people that support the arts. Um, I came to West Pelzer because I came from here. It's the place that inspires me most. It's the place where I would like to, to make the best paintings I can, I'm capable of making. Uh, as far as a job title, I, I truthfully haven't thought of it. I, I'm, I want to make the best paintings I can make. I, I have found a a uh, wonderful gentleman in Asheville, North Carolina named Michael Maines. He directs the Blue Spiral Gallery there, uh, Blue Spiral One Gallery, I should say. And uh, he'll be retailing and selling my paintings. Um, but I'm also investigating how I might uh, be a resource uh, for the state of South Carolina. I'm partnering with my mayor, uh, Blake Sanders. He's a, a dynamic uh, man. I, I'm really grateful to have him here in our community. We're looking at doing a project together with our new mun municipal center on Main Street where I'll be hosting sort of an invitational um, rotating set of exhibitions from artists in Anderson County and in Greenville County. I see West Pelzer as a, as a gateway or, or perhaps a, a point of convergence between the cultural community of Anderson and the cultural community of Greenville. There are so many amazing resources in our state uh, that I think if we really want to elevate our presence at the national and international levels, we need to have more dialogue uh, between the, both the experienced uh, artists in our, our region and also between the emerging talent in our region. And, and uh, having come up in this corridor of our state, um, there's a lot of hurdles you don't see coming. You know, if you're not, uh, uh, if you don't have access to a certain amount of privilege or experience, uh, but there's also a lot of incredible people out there. And so I, I don't have any uh, negative thing to say. Uh, it's quite the opposite. I, I'm brimming over with excitement about uh, the, the wonderful reception I've had uh, in bringing my practice here. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. While, while I don't have a job title in mind, I'm optimistic in, in what service I'll be able to do here in South Carolina. And if people want to see your work, how do they contact you? They may go to andygambrell.com. Uh, and on the website there, there's a link to contact me. And it has my email address there, which is andy at andygambrell.com. It's been fun. Thank you, Andy, for sharing your story with us, and welcome back home. Thank you very much, sir. Our guest has been Andy Gambrell from West Pelzer, artist extraordinaire, and we want to thank him for sharing his story with us, and we want to thank each of you for tuning in, and we would invite you to be back with us next week, same time, for our next edition of Conversations with Paul Brown. Until then, take care, everybody.